an absolutely buzzing, massively productive area. There's a spirit on Merseyside that is very, very difficult to pin down, but it's linked to other cultures. It's linked to football, it's linked to politics. It's very, very special. The people are really, really good people. They've got good values. And if they're investors in there, they'll deliver with interest on top. For the 30 years I was there, I can honestly say I enjoyed it all. It was a brilliant place to work for. There's a special feeling, you know, in, in the area. And we love it, absolutely love it, you know. We are fundamentally sustained by the local market. We have export, which allows us to grow and develop, but this business survives because of Merseyside. You know, and that, that's our connection to the local people. I lived south of the East Langs Road, and so the uh, primary school I went to was called Nosley Maypole. And if you looked through the railings, you could see across the East Langs Road was a, a massive factory that was then called the ICI. It was a copper extrusion plant that became Yorkshire Imperial Metals. And that was the beginning of the kind of the Kirby industrial zone, as it were. I remember being brought up in South Dean and the main road through South Dean is Moorgate Road and there was a rush hour and boy it was a rush hour you know you'd look out the window and, and the roads would be busy and then at the end of the day equally the roads were busy and they were busy with lots of people from Croxteth, not a screen in the city centre. The main bus route from town and Heighton and that came past our, our house, our prefab house uh, and, and you'd see in the morning at rush hour 16, 17, 18 buses in a row, packed to the gills with workers coming in. An absolutely buzzing, massively productive area. You could walk out of a job one day and start somewhere else the next. So busy. One of my aunties worked across the roads in Pendleton's. My nan and granddad used to work in the AC, AC Delco. I knew family and friends who worked in the craft, for instance, or Matthew Ferguson's. I worked at Otis Elevators from the late 60s to mid 70s and the motto was the Rolls Royce of the lift industry, which it was, it was class stuff, you know. They did the Victoria line in London, you know, the escalators and the lifts. They did uh, the first travelator in Europe, which was at Orly Airport in France, which is now Charles de Gaulle. Um, they did all the lift equipment and escalators on the QE2. People were friendly, there was always plenty going on, plenty of social things. They had the open days, they had dancers, they had the uh, football, uh, American baseball, darts, you know, it was happy. I mean, loads and loads of kids, when they left school, went to work in Kirby because there was all those factories, Connolly and Blackley, Dickinson's, Otis Elevator, Kraft, uh, Hygiene, uh, Bird's Eye went to the local career service which was in the town centre and one of my first jobs when I left school was I was lucky enough to take up a YTS scheme at the Bird's Eye factory which was on the industrial estate. The memories are really fantastic, really warm welcome. Everyone had a smile on the face, there was lots of camaraderie. I started in the Bird's Eye at 15 years of age, straight from school, it was 4th of January 1960. Stayed right throughout until the place closed down in, in September 89. And I loved it, I absolutely loved it. Yeah, I really loved it. Produced everything, all kinds of food. We used to eat a lot of it as well. Cheers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is of me when I was 15 years of age. I was in the froster room and I'd, I'd, you'd have to struggle around to get a pair of overalls to fit me because I was about four foot. It was all pinched up with the pinned it and everything at the back because it was very small but yeah I remember that photograph well yeah but I, I was fortunate enough to meet Marion there in oh I was only 20 then I was 18 when I started 
and I just found it daunting and going into the place it was scary. But I made a lot of good friends there. This was taken of my mum and dad who worked in the bird's eye. My father worked in the uh, cold stores. My mum worked in the laundry as a seamstress. My dad worked there when I was there. He got me my job. There was a lot of families worked there. I mean, my friends there, they were twins and both their parents worked there as well. There's that type of place, it was very uh, family orientated. I was welcomed as one of the family as a 16, 17 year old. I wasn't on much money at the time, I think it was £27.50. But you know, they made sure I was well looked after. It was a 44 and a half hour week you worked there. When I started there, I was on 63 and 6, which is £3.3 three and sixpence. And after deductions, I brought home £2.14 shillings. £2 was to my mother, but uh, it went a long way, that 14 shillings, yeah. We had a 17 or 18 week strike. Ooh, that was hard, an awful lot of people left. My God, you were living hand to mouth them days, like, yeah. This was actually taken during the 18 week strike, which was a, it was a terrible period of, of my employment there because um, an awful lot of people suffered in that 18 weeks, but all we lived on was uh, tax rebates, and that's all. But uh, yeah, it was a very, very hard time. I don't like even looking at the photograph now. It's, it's very, it's, uh, it brings back bad memories. It's very, very hard. I only stayed there six months, and the reason for that is I actually would have been under the age of 18 at the end of the scheme and they operated the three shift system at the time and they couldn't guarantee me a job. So then I decided to return to education, went to Kirby FE College, progressed on to Liverpool Polytechnic before getting a teacher training qualification and then entering the teaching industry. And then I suppose in a strange way I've returned home in terms of my day job, in terms of currently being a head teacher at All Saints High School. Cracking job, met some cracking people. No matter what I went through, all, all the years I worked there, I met some lovely people. Wish I had my time over, do it all again. <laughs> and the best thing of the lot was meeting Marion there, so. He's after something good for us too. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I get, something good for me, see. Yeah. Bed's Yeah, no, no, no not bed's eye now, no. My dad got uh, a chip shop on Admin Road. And it was, uh, it was the terminus for the buses, is where all the, the Kirby buses turned around, you know. And, uh, and he opened this chip shop, and it, it was the oddest place to open a chippy, because at night, it was empty, you know, all these factories closed. At, you know, it was a ghost town, this place. But of course, at lunchtime, he opened and created this phenomenal business. And so it would be like, my mother would be taking orders for like uh, uh, Connolly's, uh, 64 fish, uh, 75 chips, you know, curries, peas, you know, and all these orders would come in and various lads would come down and take home, you know, back to the factory, these massive, so it was such a buzzing place between 11.30 and two o'clock. Two o'clock was all over. It was like, wiped down and closed and it wasn't open again until the next morning. And this business was, it was phenomenal. I mean, I remember the, the, the long debate about whether they should introduce curry sauce. <laughs> they, they agonized for six months over that. And then in the end, they saw there was a profit in it, so they did. I remember walking up to the place, first day, and we um, good clothes, <laughs> it's a silly mistake. And it only looked like a little place from outside. And I remember walking into the back and going, oh my God, didn't know there was this many tyres. I started work at Kirby Tyres in 1982. It was on Bradman Road in Kirby Industrial Estate. Started with them when I was 16. The first thing that shot me and the dirt and the smell that rubber smell, which I, I don't smell anymore because I've been doing it for so long, but that was one of the biggest things that hit me when I first got there, was the rubber smell. It was just like a big, massive yard, you know, with them um, sheds around the edge, and it was just tyres stacked, but stacked on top of each other, and you're talking 18, 19 foot high, 
the way they used to do it. They used to have people on each stair and you used to pass the tires to each other and tie them up. You used to end up with a big pyramid of tires. I was on £25 a week. If you come in Saturday morning, you end up working, you got a fiver, you got £30 a week. It was hard work. It was really manual, really messy, really dirty. You'd be coming home, you had to strip off before you went in the house because it was that time. You were loading wagons and coming in from Ireland, cattle wagons, and then you were loading them with tyres and they'd been delivered a load of cows or something to somewhere and it was covered a foot deep in cow mess and everything else, you know what I mean? One of the things, you worked in all the weathers, you know what I mean? And the, I think the main one is the winter in the cold, you know what I mean? And you had stupid rubber gloves which just went like ice, you know what I mean? And then you had to go around getting the tyres, get the ice out the tyres so the people could examine them and make sure they were all right. But they look after me. And I think that's one of the things that I why I stick with them because they're still hands on, they still talk to you, you can still talk to the management, the top management, you know what I mean? And I think that's why I've stuck at it. I heard the studio had been bought in Kirby. And I thought, oh, you know, go down and have a look. And as you think of a double-fronted industrial building, that was Amazon. And to look at the band in the next room, in the studio, it was like a classroom door with the glass window part way up. So you had to jump up out your chair, knock on the glass, me more what you wanted, thumbs up, that sounds better, sit back down, do it, jump up, sit back down. I mean, I will never get it out of my mind. It was the first studio I'd ever been in that had daylight. There were, you know, you could see beyond the walls. And you still see, see fields, you know, beyond the window. So it was a pleasant uh, situation to be in. Jerry Lewis, who owned Amazon, uh, also had a record label, which was fairly an unknown thing for a uh, record label business to be done outside of London. I think the first artist he had out of there with the number one was China Crisis with African and White. And that's when I think people first became aware that there was a number one studio on the doorstep, as it were. I mean, I have one vague memory of China Crisis, like uh, coming to Kirby in a car with Jerry and knocking the lads up to discuss the African and White single sleeve. They were interested in having a Raoul Duffy painting on, on the sleeve. That would have involved a certain amount of copyright negotiation. So I had to transcribe that painting, in other words, copy it. Uh, we were on a real tight budget, print budget. So it had to be done in two colours. But what I used to do was do two or three colours and make them look like more. Anything to save money in the good old days of uh, Merseyside indie record production, you know. Um, because there were, the, you know, the budgets went on the recording, really, and rightly so. I would have done a tracing, and the very nature of tracing it would change it slightly. But I'd certainly keep the quality of the original. After that, I would put a second piece of tracing on and then do the second colour. So there's no drawing in that place there, but I want quite a bit of red there. So I'm adding it to this layer. The whole job would have taken around two days. The only problem is that you can't always tell what it's gonna look like, so you can have failures. But yeah, every job in a way was a revelation when it came back from the printers. And sometimes it was a good revelation and sometimes not. Hopefully most of the time it was good. But I have done some jobs that haven't worked properly, really.
We always used the same printer who got used to this way of working because nobody else was working like this. And we used local printers. Last time I used this process for an actual commercial job would have been 30 years ago, maybe more. I got a, a Mac in 1984. So that sort of dates it, you know, ish. But it does have a certain quality and I do have a certain affection for it. Whether the chaps have a certain affection for it, I don't know. We had China Crisis, we had Echo and the Bunny Men, Flock of Seagulls, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, Happy Mondays, and the such artists which then went on to be major label hit records. I mean, that period was a really exciting time to be associated with the music business. There was a total pop culture explosion. This one is uh, it's a compilation and it's from the early 80s and it features tracks that were recorded at the studio here in Kirby. It's got China Crisis, African and White on it, and that's dated January 1982. It's got Dead or Alive, Dalek I Love You, who were going to be the first band on the label, a band called The Builders, Venus Adore, and the legendary Wah. So it's a pretty good cross-section of Merseyside bands at the time. It's called Small Hits and Near Misses. Uh, which is, you know, quite, quite a nice title really, because th that is exactly what it is. Some of these were small hits and some of them were near misses. Um, I found the image in my studio and uh, I just liked the image. I, I mean, I know that's a cop-out. If you're an art student, you can't say that to your tutor. Um, but it was just that near miss thing, you know, because it's these two planes that are obviously going to crash into each other. So small hits and near misses. And interestingly, the address for the record company is the same address as for the studio. So it's Amazon Studios, Stopgate Lane, Simonswood. It was very much at the leading edge of that um, 80s sense of you don't have to be in metropolitan land in order to make records, you know. But before that, everybody got the deal, the record deal, and then to London to record. It was off down to London for wherever, you, whichever studio you were going in. But Jeremy made it happen up here, and he was bringing the artists from London. He made it happen here on Merseyside and for Merseyside. But the, it did mean that all this stuff that was produced on Merseyside, uh, either out of ignorance or whatever, um, it did have a special quality to it, you know, a really special quality to it. Frank Hornby was the son of a provisions dealer in Liverpool, family business, and one Christmas got this really, really good idea on a, on a train journey where he stopped at a railway station, looked across at the goods yard, and there was a crane, and he thought, well, hang on, I've got two lads. I can make something like this to keep my lads busy at Christmas time. So he got off the train, came roaring home and started making things from strips of copper, punching holes in, and from there it developed into Meccano. He had sold to the business with a loan from his employer with a fiver, which, uh, you know, in, uh, in the 1890s, it was quite a lot of money. Meccano started its life as mechanics made easy. And within two years of this, Frank had already cottoned on to the marketing power of the right name and he decided that Mechanics Made Easy 
uh, was too much of a mouthful, particularly if you wanted to attract kids. So we came up with the name, which was Make and Know. Make and Know, Makano. Very, very rapidly grew. And within just a few years, it expanded into through Europe. Um, he was almost caught in the Berlin offices when war broke out, but he managed to get away. And then he bought the land to build Bins Road, which is most definitely the most famous toy factory in the world at any one time.